All right. Why don't you just clap? Just think about that during. Uh, tonight is June 2nd, 2021 at 7 p.m. This is the Committee of the Whole Meeting for District 96. Uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? Ms. Murphy? Here. Mr. Marhold? Here. Mr. Barsati? Present. Mr. Muirhead? Here. Ms. Gunn? Here. And Mr. Hunt? Here. Or Ms. Present. Okay. At this time, is there any public comment? There is not. All right. Uh, are there any proposed changes to the agenda? I think we mentioned there was one minor change. We were going to move the order, uh, the discussion of strategic plan overview until after the policy committee. That way all the committee reports will dovetail with the strategic plan. Sounds good. Yep. All right. Is everyone okay with that? Yep. yep. Okay. All right, then. Next, that will bring us to committee reports. And first one listed is policy committee. All right. Well, we'll dive right in. Um, I mentioned this briefly during my last policy update at our May regular business meeting, but the policy committee has been busy. We continue to take a look at the optional press policy regarding remote learning. Um, I believe it actually came out March 2019, one year exactly pre-COVID, that at the time the board originally opted not to pursue. Um, but since COVID, school districts have taken on a renewed interest in this optional policy, especially in light of ISBE's unanimous adoption of the resolution, uh, which supports in-person learning for the upcoming school year. So there's a lot of nuances to consider with this resolution and of course, potential policy implications for school districts. So very lucky for us that we have our attorney, Shelly Anderson with us here tonight to provide us with an overview. So I'll, so yeah, floor is yours. So I think that you guys probably already started the conversation around the policy 6185. And as Stephanie mentioned, it is a, optional policy that school boards can elect to adopt. And the importance of this is that if you do not adopt the policy, you are only, only able to provide remote instruction next year to students who are ineligible for vaccination and who are under a quarantine order from the public health department. So it's a very um, small group. It's a very small exception, very different than we have this year. Now, what that remote instruction will even look like has not been fully determined by ISB yet. We expect to get a lot more information from them on what that will look like. It appears that it still needs to be five hours of instruction, similar to what it is now. But again, you're talking about kids who are only getting that remote learning during the time period for the quarantine order. So it's very small chunks of time. The only other exception would be for kids who qualify for home hospital. And that's under a completely separate policy that you already have, that's 61150. And under that policy, you don't have to provide the same remote instruction that you do under a remote learning program. That is five hours of instruction for an entire week. And that's something you've already had. That's for kids who cannot come to school because of a issue. Um, at their, they're either at home and can't come to school for a variety of reasons, or they're actually hospitalized. And there's a a procedure and a form that you follow with respect to that part of it, and you've always had that. The, the distinguishing factor here is that while a lot of districts, I think like yours, had sent out a survey to parents before the resolution was adopted last month, asking if they were still interested in having remote learning because we didn't know what the rules were going to be. And if you do not choose to adopt this policy, then you will not be able to provide remote instruction to those kids unless they qualify for the home hospital exception. So that's why it's an important piece to figure out if you're going to do or not. Um, I, I'm not sure what your surrounding districts are doing. I know Martha had some conversation with them, but it really is a decision that the board should make in looking toward if we were to adopt this policy, parents may come to expect then that they'd be able to qualify. And it's really always, under this policy, it's based on the individual student's learning needs, a determination that the learning needs are best suited to remote learning or a blended learning program. The blended learning program historically has been more for high school age kids and it's coming to school for part of the time, doing an internship and saying that that qualifies as a school day. However, ISBE's indicated that they've intentionally left it open for flexibility in the event that other districts want to find a way to make a blended program work for for students. So 
while the intent of the resolution is to get all kids back to school in person and to get all kids vaccinated, there is still this provision that they're leaving it open to say, yes, but local school boards, if you want to make a way for there to be remote learning, you can if you follow these steps. And the first step would be adopting policy 6185. And the one thing that you have to be mindful of in doing that, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have, is that how you would staff it would be very different likely than how you're currently staffing your remote learning versus your in-person learning program. Not to mention how you will staff those kids who are ineligible for vaccines and who are under a quarantine order. We're also gonna have to work through that with respect to what that looks like for them and what the teacher's response to that is and how we'll staff that. Probably not important to do that until we get more information from ISBE as to what that has to look like for that 10 day period that the kids are out. I know it's a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have about, about that. First question, when you, were, you were noting acceptable exceptions to vaccination status. I, it didn't sound like there's a religious exemption. There's not currently a religious exemption the way that they're talking about it. I, that being said, I think that most council is advising clients to say, if there is someone who has a legitimate religious exemption, we can consider them ineligible if they're also under a quarantine order. So right now, ISB is identified obviously medical reasons that a child can't be vaccinated, but for a variety of reasons, the you know, most important of which is avoiding any sort of kind of religious discrimination claim or even a, a, the likes of that, that we would want to make sure that we carve that out for families that might have that piece as well. So, so can I ask a question, sir, about that religious exemption? And this is, it might be a broader question, it might not be the right form, but what is considered a legitimate religious exemption? Well, it depends on what you're looking at. So right now, in terms of vaccinations generally, you likely have a form that parents can fill out, and all they have to do is cite that they have a religious, a religious reason uh, for not wanting or having their child vaccinated. And very few schools kind of go behind that to say what is actually the religious reason behind that, that you're not going to do that. This became a much bigger issue during COVID during the testing process when families were saying that they wanted to opt out of saliva screening for religious reasons. But the way that ISBE has the section written now that allows for families to not have their children vaccinated and come to school, it is very broadly written as to the basis for which the parents can say, this you know, is against my religion in some way. And uh, the, there are very few opportunities to really push back on that for, for many school districts. However, some did in the context of COVID and the testing. So we're seeing a little bit more of that this year. But it's pretty broad, yeah. so. I guess, I guess I bring that up, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I did hear a conversation recently uh, which mentioned no major religion has provided any kind of <clears throat> guidance that their membership not be vaccinated. So, um, but it sounds like the, it would be in the interest of the district to carve out that religious exemption anyway, or? Well, and you gotta remember that it does not have to be identified by one of the major religious groups. It can be really the, the parents or family's religion mm -hmm. that they ascribe to. So what I would suggest is that in the event that this comes up and we have a family that comes to us and says, I need remote learning because my child's under a quarantine order. And if we say, well, is your, if, you know, if the child's under 12, that's an easy answer. But if they were to say, I guess, how old are your kids here? The oldest in the... Uh, so you're right, our 12 only really impacts about half of our middle school. Okay. So most of our children are not yet eligible for vaccines. But that, that's likely going to change in the coming months, so... Yeah, it might change before the school year starts, but in any event, mm -hmm. we'd be looking at that kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, Dan. I don't think we would make a general statement that if you have a, a, a religious exemption for that, we would look at it on a case-by-case -case basis as to what the, we have the family fill out the same form, likely as a starting point that they fill out now for those families who don't otherwise get their children vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And it's an and, Shelley, right? It's, it's ineligible for the vaccine and, and under a quarantine order. Correct. Those are the students that would get okay. remote education. So, so that's, that's, I mean, that's really a very small, like, very small. And only, only for that. If you've been exposed right. in a quarantine and you haven't been vaccinated. So it does not. So it's not, and it's policy. not, hasn't been vaccinated. It's ineligible. Ineligible. So if you had, if let's say the, vaccination policy changes and by next year it's five and you know older can get it 
If a family chooses, chooses not right. to get their child vaccinated and their child has to quarantine, the district cannot provide them remote learning and have it count for school days the same way it does now. So how we handle that will also be an interesting thing, and I think we're likely to see more from the state board in a FAQ as to what that actually looks like for the district for next year. Michelle, you said cannot provide, or is not obligated to provide? Cannot provide. Cannot provide. So this, this really means that we, we don't make the unique exception. Well, that maybe we could do that. It's really cannot. And you have to remember, when we're saying can or can't, it has to do with whether or not those days of attendance count for that student. So I'm not saying that we couldn't provide some instruction for that student if the district wanted to do that. It's a question of how that student would otherwise be characterized. So would they just be out sick, like they're typically out sick, mm -hmm. as opposed to this idea that they're involved in instruction? And I'd have to say a lot of this is going to have to do with what that remote learning looks like for those kids who fall into that very small bucket. Mm -hmm. And if it's possible for you to expand that at all, to have some benefit for that child, but again, whether or not that day will count for that child or for the district, if you were to make it a broader um, program, you'd really have to have this very specific policy to do that. So, so essentially, in order, if we wanted to provide remote pr programming to students of possibly families who just are in a medical situation, not the student, but the family, and we would have to pass this policy, we would have to approve this policy as well. Okay, just wanted to make sure. And we have about 12 families that have expressed some interest in possible remote education, okay. mostly due to um, identified medical conditions within the household. Right. Yeah, so the, the, I'll just say the policy and the, the statute that it relates to talk about the determination made by the child's caregiver as well as the district that the remote program best serves the individual learning needs of the student. Right. So when we first read that before the FAQ from ISBE came out, you'd think, well, if they're just needing it because they have someone in the home, right, who's got immun immunocompromised, that wouldn't necessarily right. apply. However, that is one of the examples ISBE gave in their FAQ to say that this person might then qualify under 6185, that policy, for an individualized remote learning program. I, I think that we're likely to see them elaborate a bit more on that as to you know, why they're reading that so broadly if the intention is truly to get as many kids back to school as possible. Mm -hmm. So that, that struck me as odd when I read that piece okay. that they put out in the FAQ. But I think you said from the beginning, Shelley, this is something that I know we've talked about a few times and I've talked with our leadership team that it certainly seems, there it is, that the Illinois State Board of Ed is clear. They want children to come back to full in person. Yes. And that by writing the or regulation or resolution this way is to say children need to be back. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the state superintendent was clear when she, during the board meeting where this was unanimously adopted, it could not have been clear that that was the intent of writing it this way and making this group of students who can have remote learning so, so small. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you mentioned that passing this policy would be the first step among many to setting up an alternative program like that. I mean, what, what are those additional steps? Is this something that that the district is responsible for or something that the, the family is responsible so for? So it's really the district. So you'd adopt the policy first. Mm -hmm. uh, the policy would then have to be sent to ISBE and get approved. And you know most policies that are following press will obviously get approved by ISBE. And then under the policy, it speaks to exactly the plan that you have to develop for the individual student to make a determination of what that program is going to look like for them for that period of time, whether it's you know, a six month period of time, a year period of time. So those are all things that the administration will do to make a determination to, show, to work with the family to say, this is what the program's going to look like and now we've kind of checked all the boxes that are required in order to have this be a legitimate remote program under the law. Mm -hmm. And again, that's individualized to the student. Yeah. It's not kind of a general group of, of kids the way the law is written. Just following up real quickly to what Martha was saying on the 12 families identified thus far through the survey that when went out, you indicated many districts sent out um, similar surveys perhaps. But I know that it wasn't, you know, an exactly an, an invitation, right? You were generating and getting a sense of perhaps need. And then within that, how would we identify perhaps what constitutes a medical need? I mean, what would perhaps be criteria that would we be putting into place in terms of documentation, medical records, 
what would we be requiring from these 12 families to then prove that they would qualify for the individualized learning plan? And that'd be up for the district to decide. But, but certainly it seems that it's some kind of individualized assessment. Correct. It's, you know, it's an assessment unique to that child, to that child's home learning environment, Correct. medical conditions within the home, as well as just the overall learning needs and, and how this plan works. Correct, yes. So, you know, I, I think that, that part of the process is also significant. I know Pam and I have talked about this. It starts to resemble almost the kind of evaluation you might do for a child with an individualized education plan, mm -hmm. um, perhaps even more in depth than that. I mean, there's certainly one of the other questions that's been raised is how do you evaluate a medical condition in the home? I mean, that becomes a very sensitive issue also for a school district to address. Yes. Whereas with home hospital, it's clear there's medical documentation from a physician or advanced practice nurse. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a there are specific guidelines, and it's usually a specific medical condition with a specific timeline in terms of when it's anticipated that a child would return to school. So, under under a situation like this, would uh, the hypothetical student be remotely taught by their whatever the regular teacher they would have been assigned previously or what's what's the is there a thought for how that would work so yeah so it, it is something we've given a fair amount of thought to because prior to the ISB resolution it was something we thought we might be required to do and, and again I think as a district we've been very successful with our remote learning plan but again not without you know, a, a lot of a lot of impact on um, staff and students both. So, as you know, we've done sort of the what we call the dual platform over at our middle school, where teachers really taught simultaneously to a group of children who were at home virtually and were participating on Zoom, and then a group of students in the classroom. At the elementary level, we set up a remote academy where we really had separate teachers who were specifically teaching the remote students, and that was. You know, fairly easy to determine based on needs. You know, as we know, we had about 75% of our families in person and about 25%, I and mean, that number fluctuated a little bit as the year went on. But that idea of a, of a dual platform, what I think people are starting to realize is that that kind of goes away when the great majority of your students are now in school, as is our hope, as the intention of the State Board of Ed, as is also our intention. So, you know, do we have, and we've thought about this, is there a teacher per grade level district wide that might be able to do that? Do we enroll that classroom differently? Fewer children in person so that they have more time to dedicate to virtual? Do they need other technologies? We've talked about the fact that, you know, are there other ways that this could become sort of uh, more seamless for the students? Um, so I think there's a personnel issue to this. There's a technology issue. I mean, there's certainly a cost associated and, um, certainly for families in need, I don't want to, you know, distill it down to a cost issue, but it is not, um, it is not an easy thing to do. I think we've done it well, but I think that there, there's a, an anticipation of as we near what's, I, I sort of say the pandemic ending, let's hope it's ending, right? But that, um, that school really can return to normal. And, you know, I think what I'm beginning to hear more and more from the principals, and I think it's because people made such, you know, great efforts along the way, is that there have been a lot of challenges to do. And, uh, you know, in turning to the remote students, what's the impact on the in-person students? And while everyone was sort of flexible and um, with that idea, will, will that be less the case when really the great majority of students are in person? And the messaging around it seems to be that that's, that's the best way we educate children. So I think for the board to understand, it does come with, with other implications. So I have another question, and it might be just with this policy, if we didn't pass it or if we do pass it, how, how would this affect, say, a future pandemic or a future healthcare crisis? I mean, I don't mean to be like, but I mean, it was just recently in the news that they just, the avian flu just spread from, to a human. And so, I mean, I don't mean to be, I just don't, it, it will this pigeonhole us from flexibility going forward? I, I, well, I mean, possibly, but I will say that I think that if, it, if there was another pandemic, similar to what happened this time. The, there still exists a section of the school code that talks about if the governor declares a disaster, mm -hmm. different rules apply. And those rules would still be in place as long as there was a disaster declared. So you'd still likely have that happen if you were talking about something even remotely similar to what we had now with the pandemic. Um, with respect to this policy, I don't think it would necessarily 
help you in a situation like that because there'd be so many kids who might have to fall under it that we, we would certainly hope that the state would do what they did this time and make an exception for that sort of situation different than the idea behind this policy is really it's specific to the child as to their specific learning needs we must best met in a remote program so I don't think it would necessarily um, you could always then I mean, God forbid we saw that happening, you could then adopt it. Now, there's not a timeline here. I mean, you can certainly adopt it if you felt you needed it and get the state board to approve it, and then we could work through getting the logistics as far as that goes. But as Martha mentioned, it's not only a cost, there's also a staffing issue related to it, and what that will look like for the REC if we suddenly had this other remote program with just a handful of kids in it. This is slightly a tangent, but has there been any conversation about, um, like possibly through West 40 or some consortium of doing a remote program? So if we have 12 learners and we grab the, you know, handful of learners from every other district and then they have a remote classroom as if, you know, like our remote academy, has there been any conversation about that? Because that seems like the most uh, efficient way to handle this as opposed to us trying to figure out how this one fourth grader and three third graders mesh into our our programming? If I can sure, uh, add on to that. I mean, I do know like some of the Catholic schools, the way they handle remote learning, they just actually contract it out to a company to right. provide the education. So Which kind of would be difficult at the, at the elementary level. I'm not sure how great that, you know. Like, right, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah. right, but I mean, I know it was done at the elementary right. level. And I'm not saying that's the right way to go. I'm just curious right. if that conversation is going. Yeah, that conversation has has been going on. So West 40 is the, um, you know, consortium of uh, West Cook County. I think there's 39 school districts, not 40. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they have said, you know, what about that very idea? Um, what's interesting is I think that's maybe gotten a little momentum at the high school level, yeah. a little bit less at elementary. Um, and still, okay. I would say it. I wouldn't say it has momentum. Okay. I'd say that it's sort of kind of been an on and off again interest. I think. I would think most superintendents. I think it was our anticipation that the, the need for remote learning might be ongoing. I think what we've seen is the pandemic. You know, knock on wood, seems to be moving in a favorable direction for, you know, a, a return to school. And then I think the state board of ed was very loud and clear just mm -hmm. very recently. And I think that is kind of shifted everyone's thinking about, you know, just because we maybe can do this, should we do this? And I think that is exactly the, the challenge to the Board of Education around this policy is, you know, what is what is the best thing? What is in the best interest of our students mm -hmm. moving forward? And, you know, we do know there's a, a, for us, a very small number of children, but certainly a group that we want to make sure that we're serving very Absolutely. appropriately and effectively. So, so I think there is. I think there is a real challenge in this decision around this policy. And then, you know, as Shelley points out, it's also then having the ISB approve it and coming up with an assessment plan so that we are making the appropriate determinations. So that we're also really encouraging children to be back in school. So, and I'm not speaking about the 12 families because I don't know the 12 families, but. We know that um, in schools we deal with things like school anxiety, school refusal, um, mm -hmm. truancy. I mean, those are unusual circumstances, but those are circumstances, and I think the State Board of Ed was also alluding to that we don't want children to stay out of school for the wrong reasons, right? right? That we do believe that some children coming back to school is going to be very hard, you know, um, and that some of the social isolation has not been good for children. And I think that's why the state has been so clear and, and we are not a high school district but from what we have learned I think high schools were hit hardest by some of that and so again I think there's just a very strong push at the state level to bring children back to school and as we all know we've had our children pretty much you know I mean 80 85 percent right back uh, full in person since mid-April and so I also think for our community my sense is people have looked around and said oh Kids are back in school, kids have been healthy, kids have been happy, kids are learning. Mm -hmm. So even a few families that have been hesitant, I think also kind of recently, and even you know, at least one of the families on our, you know, sort of the survey and invitation stuff, and as you say, we're like, I think we are gonna come back to school. Okay. Um, not probably even necessarily acknowledging that the State Board of Ed is sort of incenting, incenting us to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. 
and, and might even more families by the time fall comes around. Let's hope again that the pandemic continues to move in the right direction and not the wrong direction. Say, wow, our friends and neighbors are back and things seem to be going well and we'd like to be back in school too. And that's what we would hope. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this dialogue has been about like what's happening right now for next year, but this is going to be a continuous policy. So thinking 2022, 20, 23, 24, hopefully COVID is gone by then. So this doesn't say anything about COVID or COVID related needs. It just says basically a medical exemption, which could really be anything. So is this, I mean, let's just say in two years, it's one family or two families, and now and our costs don't change. It's still the same kind of problem, but it's for even less people. Um, just, I guess, what's the, what's the dialogue been around, like, beyond COVID, beyond, like, future school years and how this policy would stay in place or hold up? Yeah, so, I mean, you have to remember that it's something that the school would have to, the district have to agree with the family that they qualified for this remote learning program okay. under the policy. It's not just any medical reason mm -hmm. gets you. That's, that would provide you for home hospital that you're guaranteed under the school code, but very different than the remote learning program. Right. So it would be in the future. It actually, you know, as Stephanie mentioned, it was done before COVID mm -hmm. in terms of not necessarily related to COVID. And there were very few districts that actually adopted it at the time just because they adopt what press puts out and they have it and in terms of, kind of what it was actually going to look like or needed for they haven't actually had cause to use it yet um, but this would live long after the pandemic for those families who might need it um, and the district agreed that it best met that child's individual learning needs the home hospital was adopted before the or the the yeah. home hospital was adopted before the pandemic, but yeah. the press policy that we're talking about now Six, was, one, eight, five, was put out before the pandemic. Well, this was put out. Before. We just yes. didn't, really, we didn't approve time. it. Oh, okay, all right. Because it was like an optional. <coughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. And it seemed never thinking about a pandemic yeah. that it was more geared toward high schools or yeah. I mean, there's it didn't seem that it there's was, even a line saying it's a yeah. you know limited to juniors and seniors who demonstrate you know so. It, well, I, it wasn't I, geared towards this. But it's I, I do wonder, though, I, I think, uh, Shelley, you mentioned that the rules are different under emergency declaration or disaster declaration. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm assuming that declaration is still in place. That is currently still in place. So this resolution takes effect. It gives, it gives the state superintendent the authority to make the declaration mm -hmm. for the 21-22 school year. So right now we're in this period where the executive order has just come out related to next year. We are likely to see the, the declaration come out at the time now. So right now what we have is ISBE saying, we give you the authority to make this declaration, and the state superintendent is likely to do that effective for next school year. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for the summer school, those schools that do summer school, they can still operate under um, the remote program that we've been doing this school year. Because the current executive order, the disaster declaration, doesn't expire until the end of June. And this doesn't have anything to do with the five learning days or whatever. E-learning like e days? Yeah. No. But that's completely separate. Completely this separate. Yeah. Trying to override that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Shelley, we've we've heard it. Martha's mentioned it, and so has everybody else. But we've there's this idea that the parents are going to say that. I have a legitimate reason to go remote with, with my child. But then the district also has to agree that this is a reasonable thing to do. But we've also said that the, say the religious um, carve out, excuse me, I can't think of the right word, is rather broad. So what kind of situation does this put us into potentially if the district doesn't agree or doesn't feel like the parent is really giving a good reason and we've heard there's a lot of challenge in trying to be respectful but and do you follow where I'm going with this I do, there's Joyce. a there's a needle that seems to need to be threaded here and I don't know how that works in practice because we get away from just the 
I want versus I need, and that's often a tough thing to differentiate for some people. And I think that it would really depend in that situation and why it's such a difficult needle to thread is because no one's done it before in terms of trying to actually analyze why would this student versus this student need this remote learning program. So for instance, it might be that two families say, for religious reasons, we want our child home, for instance. And there might be the reason of why behind that that differentiates why you might have one say, you qualify for this program, but this student you don't, as opposed to just this broad, for a religious reason, I don't want my student in. ISBE and the state superintendent were very clear. Students are supposed to be in school learning. What we've done so far the last year and a half is no longer the norm. So it's really only going to be for that unique situation. If you adopt this policy, that the student is going to be permitted to learn in a remote program. So again, if you don't adopt this policy, those students are just out. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you consider them truant, the State Board has said, well, that's up to you, Board of Education, to decide what qualifies as truant or not. But what that family's option is to, if they don't qualify for home hospital, is to go to private school. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the option they have, or homeschooling. It seems, and this is a non-legal opinion, so it actually the district has more flexibility without having the policy in place in many ways because you don't have this potential obligation to assess a good reason and potentially get into uh, a dispute that goes much further than just the principal to the family. Is that? I, w I would say yes, and you don't get into the situation where we have to then figure out, okay, if we adopt this policy and then we have, we determine that this is the threshold, and we have 12 families who meet the threshold, how are we going to serve those kids? What does that actually going to look like for those students? Because I think most families who answered surveys, whether it's yours or in another district, did so under the impression that the remote program they wanted was the one they had last year. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And it is likely not going to look like that anywhere. Um, unless you were to do a remote academy or unless you were to get together with other districts. Um, so you might see that number of 12, you know, change to five if the parents learned that what they were actually getting was much more, you know, asynchronous learning and not right. actually engaging with their classmates and all of that, um, which might be the reality if you look at how you're going to be able to provide instruction to those kids. It, it potentially becomes a rather significant investment to direct remote learning at an individual versus 10 individuals. When you spread, you know, if you have, if of those 12, there's one in every grade, yes. for example. Right, I mean, we, uh, I, I do not, envision a scenario where we have our remote academy next right. year. You know, I mean, uh, interesting idea, will West 40 have one? If it was, we would probably like pay an individual tuition or something for children to attend something like that. And that's, again, even if they decide to put those component pieces together, and that's very unclear. But again, to, to Shelley's point that if families are expecting that there will be a third grade remote academy that might have 20 students in the class, then it's felt you know, about as close to normal as we could get, right? Because we had enough children and families opting for remote that we really created true classroom communities, you know, kind of typical of typical class size. And I think those children have been served well, but it really it was because 20 to 30 percent of our families overall at the beginning of the year wanted that approach. And so it made sense for us to staff that approach. It also made sense because then that 20 to 30 percent of our students weren't attending school in person. Um, so it really was a, it worked very well in terms of how we blended all of our personnel, you know, um, structures and, and work, work with the children. So that won't, that won't exist. You know, the, the interesting question is would a dual platform still serve these children? And then that starts to speak to what modifications would need to be done in that classroom so that the children in person don't feel that services to them are somehow less than the, the the classroom that doesn't have any remote students attending. Um, I think as, as excellent as our remote teaching has been, our virtual teaching has been to our students, I don't know that there's a teacher that thinks it was their best way of teaching. Right. You know, I think they made great adaptations and great modifications 
I don't think anybody thinks that's the better way to teach students. Well, I and I would say I have a lot of concern about trying to, and I'm theorizing here, but have a classroom of ten ki of nineteen kids, and then there's one remote. So how does the teacher balance their attention? And that's that's a big ask of of the teacher themselves. That's very challenging. That's what we. That's exactly it, Joel. That's exactly what we have learned. Teachers have learned that's very challenging. They feel that they're not perhaps giving their best selves to the in person or to the remote students. Just something else to consider when we're talking about kind of that group of parents that might have said they wanted it because they expected it to be the dual platform. Yeah. Under this policy 615 that supports the section of the school code that it relates to, there is no requirement of in-person interaction with the teacher. This is really a remote learning program. Mm -hmm. And the plan itself developed for the child has to say, this is when there's going to be interaction, but there's no mandate of how often that is. So it literally could be entirely remote that you're teaching that student. And you have to designate a parent who's going to be the supervisor at home to confirm that they're going to be there. I mean, there, there's a whole host of things that would have to go into this. If you were to adopt a policy, then the plan comes into effect and has all these specifics in it. Hmm. What I can certainly do is bring more information back about the West 40 option. Um, as I said, it just hasn't been something that there's been clarity around yet. I think districts, um, and talking to our neighboring districts, and I've been doing that, I think everybody's kind of very much in the same process that we're in right now. They're yeah. they're considering this, and um, in terms of our kind of most immediate group, um, there have not been decisions made yet, to, to my knowledge. Do we have to make this by a certain? Uh, I mean, I would think we would need to have some lead time. If we do decide to uh, up, adopt this policy, I would think there needs some lead time. So when are we? Whether we adopt or meeting. don't adopt, I, I think it's it's important to tell these 12 families that there might not be a remote education yeah. program, or if there is a remote education program, just having the time to kind of coordinate the pieces for it. So mm -hmm. I know, I, you know, typically we discuss a policy at a committee of the whole as we are tonight and then might vote on it at the June 16th meeting. That would be my recommendation that we, we do that just so that we can communicate with the families. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, school will be out, but it's it's um, certainly gives them advanced you know information to be able for us to either plan for the remote plan or for them to plan them to mm -hmm. make decisions mm -hmm. about either coming back in person or finding an alternative. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Or thank you so much. As, if right. not, shall I for answering? Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Was there anything further to discuss on the second policy listing? That was really just there as an informational item so that, okay. uh, as Shelley said, the home hospital is a policy that's already in place. It's something that we already provide services when children are eligible under that home hospital determination. So I just okay. want you to understand that the policy we already have, so let's say we were to opt not to have a remote learning plan, we still will have the home hospital option for families. Okay. All right. Thanks, right. Shelley. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then that takes us then back to uh, letter D, the strategic plan overview. So what we thought we'd do, Dan, is I'm going to, our leadership team is going to join me and we're going to provide you with an overview of the strategic plan. I know you've been provided with uh, the component pieces of the strategic plan as it's developed and evolved, and I think everyone knows Wesley and Dan have been our two board members participating in the planning process, but um, the pieces have come together, so what we want to share tonight is essentially a, a draft of the proposed plan, give you a little bit of background um, review of the development of it, and an opportunity to ask questions, and we thought we'd kind of dig in by each committee then, and we've had an opportunity to check in with each committee chair or chairs to talk about how this relates to future future committee work. So with that, I'm going to find the clicker here. <laughs> um, so first I want to start by thanking our strategic plan team. Uh, there were 34 members that participated on our team. And we had some students from Riverside Brookfield High School that had been through the District 96 system join us. 
parents in the community. One community member had been a former parent. And then uh, staff members, um, both sort of at our classroom teaching level specialists and also some of our support staff join us, our administrative team, and then two board members, as I said, Dan and Wesley. So special thanks to them. Um, so again, I just um, want to reiterate, and we'll talk about a little bit as we go through the plan. I, you know, I was so impressed by the level of conversation, the level of engagement, the just true commitment and dedication to this district and to the improvements that this district and that their community is interested in, our staff and teachers are interested in seeing this district make. So again, just a really great process to be part of and to be part of all the conversations. And that's what we're gonna to try to bring to you tonight is some of the, the richness that was represented in all of that. So um, we worked with the Consortium for Educational Change um, to help us facilitate this process. This is a, a component of work that they do with districts. This is kind of, a, we say, in their wheelhouse, so to speak. I really spoke about the pillars of a strategic plan around mission, vision, values, and goals and strategies. So we're going to dig into some of this tonight and some of the, the process pieces around how this was developed. So as I shared, our strategic plan team met on 10 different occasions, all on Zoom. Um, originally, our plan and our hope had been to do this in person over some full day sessions and CEC made a modification for the pandemic and I think it actually worked quite well is knew that we probably would not be do well with Zoom all day or sitting on Zoom for six or seven hours at a time and Wesley and Dan are nodding here. Um, so we did everything in two hour chunks. We met from four to 6 p.m. on 10 different occasions and they were, those different occasions were identified as our orientation data retreat, vision retreat, setting direction retreat and then a strategic plan approval. We also reached out to stakeholders a couple different times. So we sent, essentially sent our SWOT analysis out to, to the entire community and actually received, I went back and looked tonight, we had um, 189 parents that responded and gave us feedback um, based on our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis that the team had identified along with 75 staff and two community members. Then when the plan really came into draft status, we sent it out again and really said, is this represent and reflect the kinds of, you know, mission, vision, values, strategies, goals um, that you would want to see in a plan for District 96. And at that time, we received responses from 199 parents, 48 staff, and one community member. We started with an in-depth data retreat. And uh, this is, again, just a representation of the different areas of data that we looked at. We looked at student achievement, student learning data. Um, we also looked at climate and culture data. And we looked at technology and um, sort of our, our assets in the community. And then we looked at financial information as well. So again, looking to inform the group that was sitting with us, the 34 members sitting with us, give them as much context and background as they may have heard along the way, but really uh, very explicitly sharing that with them. And again, this is the, the SWOT analysis. And I talked about how that went out to the community for additional feedback. So while there were the 34 members sitting in Zoom and sitting in breakout sessions having discussions, and I feel like we did, you know, that extra layer of gathering more community feedback. I know we brought that back to the board for some additional feedback as well. So I just feel like there was a, a nice process around gathering feedback along the way. The next um, area that we moved into was visioning, and that really is this idea of looking at a preferred future. What, what in the ideal sense, how would we want District 96 to look and to feel for our students, but also for our parents and for our staff? Um, so that was, that was another great process, a lot of great conversations. We were asked to go and visit other schools virtually by looking at videos and information about um, other, other school districts. So again, in our virtual world, I think we made good use of, um, of the process and, and it really came to this idea of a preferred mission, vision, values, and motto, which we're going to dig into here in a little bit. Um, so this is our, our mission statement that we came to as, as a team with a motto that is empowering learners for life. Dan, I think you said that you may have been one of the chief wordsmithers behind that one. We did so much work in breakout groups and then editing groups and back to breakout groups that, um, Dan, if you want to claim that one, you know, absolutely. But um, it's, a, it's a good one. And uh, mission, so we talk a lot in school districts that mission should be something that people can just sort of embrace and understand, be able to repeat and, you know, as much as our last mission statement I think was very meaningful, I think it was one that left people, you know, kind of stumbling and stammering a bit like, does it say this or does it say that exactly? So 
we're hoping that this is one that um, is meaningful, but also something that people can really relate to and, and understand and see and, and see represented in our district. We then really talked about, you know, clear vision, um, vision, vision and values, and again went uh, round and round. Just again, critical here. I don't necessarily need to read read them to you, but. Um, you know, fostering a student passion for learning. I mean, they're, they're good, so I sometimes can't help it. Um, <laughs> celebrating and rewarding curiosity, creativity, innovation, and experimentation. Closing opportunity and equity gaps to ensure high levels of achievement and expectations for all learners. Nurturing the whole child and empowering learners to grow socially, emotionally, and physically, showing respect for self, others, and the community. Embracing individual differences, supporting learners' effective collaboration and instructors and create relevant and authentic learning experiences that extend beyond the text and classroom and provide real life application and allocate our resources, including our facilities, to enhance learning and teaching to achieve this mission. So this is it, just kind of in a different format around, again, sort of our values and what we stand for. A lot of discussion around this. It looks sort of simple and straightforward, but there was a, a lot, again, sort of within and underneath and coming to those agreements. So then we came to these five big goal areas. That's something we're gonna dig in here um, in a minute with, with each of our leaders that are likely to be our goal champions for this. Um, and again, those are the, the key, key areas of our, our growth in a broad sense. Another way of looking at both those goals and strategies, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, uh, a little bit more in depth here in just a second. Another way of looking at it, so again, I think CEC is, do, it does a nice job of sort of showing this to us in different formats, again, to make it as digestible as possible. I do want to say, and I know as our leaders talk a little bit more, the key performance indicators right now are samples or drafts or our ideas. These are not things that we have formally agreed to. As you know, we haven't formally agreed to any really component, any components of this plan. It's really something that we're sharing with all of you tonight and then informally vote on at our June 16th meeting. So with that, our first big goal area, student growth and achievement is obviously key to any high quality school district. And Angela's gonna be our goal champion, no surprise, as our director of teaching and learning that this will be um, a goal area that she will facilitate. Not alone, you know, we've all you know, been assuring each other that this doesn't mean she gets all this work done, but um, sort of as the, I like the word goal champion, it's a CDC term they use, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Good evening. Uh, I asked to switch it up and see if I could be the gold champion for stewarded, stewarding resources, but I was told no. Um, anyhow, so no surprise, I get to be the gold champion for student growth and achievement, which is our first goal um, in the strategic plan that we came up with as a committee, which looks at ensuring high levels of learning for all students. And within that goal, we're looking at three strategies over this course of a five-year plan, right? So that's the thing that's really been drilled with me because I'm excited about the strategic plan, excited about the strategies under all five goals, and can't wait to jump in. But the thing that I just keep reminding myself, we keep talking about as a leadership team, is that it is a five-year plan, and that these are things that we would look at over the course of five years. So over the course of five years, we're going to work on addressing opportunity and equity gaps. We are a very high performing district and it's great. But as we went through the data retreat for the strategic planning process, what we did notice is that not all of our students are as high performing as we're showing overall. And so we want to really focus in on that, continue the high performance for our students that are already meeting the standards and exceeding standards. But we also want to work on addressing the students who aren't at that high level. So we want to work on addressing opportunity and equity gaps. We want to look at developing a standards-based monitoring and reporting progress. Currently, when we look at how we provide feedback to parents and students, we do it by grades, by points. But what we're finding in research is that looking at mastery is what's more effective for our students. And while this is work that had been explored previously in our district, we hadn't moved forward past exploring the philosophy of all of it. And now the strategic plan has brought it back up as something we should continue to look at and work on developing a new method to report how our students are achieving in our district. Looking at standards and mastery of those standards and then how do we communicate that to our families and to our students. We are already focused with Common Core State Standards 
our instruction has already been moving towards that standards-based learning. But then what we report on our report cards is grades and numbers, and students are working towards how can I get a higher number, or higher grade, rather than how can I master that standard. So we want to merge the two thoughts so that we're working on the same path and reporting out on what we're actually doing in our classrooms. And then the third and final strategy for this goal is exploring the implementation of full day kindergarten with a district-wide task force. We know that there have been different stages over the past at least decade that this district has been exploring kindergarten, like the feasibility of full day kindergarten. So did we have the facilities for full day kindergarten? Did we have the financial resources for full day kindergarten? We want to take that information that has been worked on over the past decade and also look at what's the need tell us? How will this work to address an overarching goal that the strategic plan would drive and explore the possibility of implementing full day kindergarten? So um, there was a lot of conversation around the implementation of full day kindergarten across the whole strategic planning group. Um, a lot of passion about looking at full day kindergarten, possibly implementing full day kindergarten. So um, this feels like something that our community is really reaching out and asking about. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see what are some of the key performance indicators. And as Martha mentioned, these are just suggestions. These are not settled on. These would be things that the action teams would look at for each strategy and determine what's going to measure what our actual goal, because we'll, we would create SMART goals for these strategies. So what would measure our achievement towards that SMART goal? Some of the ideas for key performance indicators for goal one for student growth and achievement include looking at growth and proficiency for math and IAR, which is something we already do yearly as a district um, for a board report, but as a leadership team, principals, um, ca the cabinet leadership team, we look at those at least three times a year, if not more in between, to determine what we're doing. Um, also looking at outcomes that focus on excellence and equity exploring the opportunity and equity gaps we currently have and providing measures that will show if we are reducing those gaps. Another possible performance indicator would be looking at high school success, um, which could include the ninth grade on track data that the state provides uh, for RB and exploring how our students are doing once they get to RB as ninth graders. We are working on actually just through the MTSS process and the refining our MTSS process, we have already started talking about different data-driven practices. The strategic plan fits well with that and would, we would be able to, or we would continue the work that we were doing with our data-driven practices, exploring data in different ways and digging into it more often. Looking at differentiated supports, having student goal setting, planning and decision-making um, what you'll hear from everybody when we talk about the strategic plan is just some of the student focus pieces and bringing the students more into their learning. Kindergarten readiness and support and then perceptual data being that climate data, the survey type data to see how our stakeholders are viewing the academic and the achievement growth of their students and themselves if they are students. Um, that is another possible key performance indicator. Hey, is our goal champion for the learning environment and culture. So goal two has to do with our learning environment and culture. And with that, we're looking to cultivate a safe, secure, and inclusive learning environment that is responsive to the evolving needs of each student. And when we look at the strategies that we outlined, number one is ensure consistent integration of social emotional learning with the core curriculum. And there was a lot of discussion about the fact that yes, we do need a social emotional learning curriculum, but that should not just be a standalone curriculum. It should be something that is embedded and integrated into everything that we do throughout an instructional day. And that is really the true way that you see that a social emotional curriculum is working as well. The language is consistent and it is used throughout the day. Number two, provide student-centered learning opportunities that personalize avenues for student engagement and agency. 
And this was another area that we spent quite a bit of time talking about too and analyzing different opportunities of having students taking more ownership of their learning, that they become more involved and more engaged when they are learning something that may be more of a personalized learning plan. And they really take the ownership and they're engaged and truly learn many more aspects than one would think at times. And three, implement, cult implement a culturally responsive approach to student learning that validates and reflects student diversity, identity, and experience. We had a much discussion too about do students see themselves in our curriculum? And do other students understand one another? And how do students identify in their learning environment? So some of the ways that we would look at this are student attendance. As I mentioned before, student engagement and agency, that agency being learning through meaningful projects and ways that students can connect to their learning in a meaningful way to them individually. Social emotional learning, again, just not standalone but embedded throughout the day as well. And I know some things that the board has talked about in the past too, expanding those co-curricular experiences learning experiences outside of the educational day. Student behavior, we always want to look at our student behavior data when looking at culture and environment. And perceptual data, that would be something that you would look at through various questionnaires of students and staff and families, how they perceive the culture and the learning environment. Our curriculum materials, again, looking at that, making sure that there's that cultural diversity, students can see themselves, which again goes with the cultural competency, and student goal setting, planning, and decision making, which that goes along too with that student engagement and student agency. Students taking more ownership of their learning and having a vested interest in their learning and where they're going helps with the culture and environment. A digital citizenship of each children, of each, of each student for children to be responsible in their use of technology personally and in the world, and soft skill development in students. And sometimes when we talk about soft skills, it refers more to people skills, interactions, conflict resolution, problem solving, learning to be part of a team. Some of those really lifelong lessons that you can learn and use throughout your whole entire life. And those personalized learning opportunities that we just discussed, and a supportive environment, making sure that our children feel supported in their learning and how they're learning in their environment. Thank you, Pam. So as we know, Don's leadership as the Director of Technology and Innovation stretches across multiple areas, um, but will be our gold champion for high quality staff. Yes, I have the uh, goal three high quality staff uh, component which my expertise largely just comes as being a high quality staff member. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the, um, the main goal is to recruit, develop, and retain exceptional personnel uh, for all positions. And uh, the strategies looking to implement would be to provide a personalized professional learning environment that includes mentoring, coaching, and collaboration as well as to recruit and, retrain, re, uh, recruit and to retain a diverse uh, workforce. So looking at some of the key performance indicators that, that we'll be evaluating, we'd be looking at uh, advanced degrees and certifications, uh, looking at our staff demographics, uh, staff retention, salaries and benefits, um, our performance reviews, uh, staff satisfaction, uh, satisfaction with professional development and collaboration opportunities, overall staff satisfaction, a new teacher support, mentoring and coaching support, personalized professional learning, professional development to ensure student agency and ownership, cultural competency and bias training and support, and stay interviews. Actually, I will be the goal champion for goal number four around family and community partnerships. Um, our goal there is to build a strong support system by engaging families, partners, and the greater community to meet the needs of all students. 
um, to cultivate opportunities to engage families in the community with the development and articulation of authentic student learning experiences and student le learning experiences that extend beyond the classroom. So this really speaks to our families satisfied, our families engaged in the process. Um, I know we, we all believe that families are our partners in, in this process of educating their children. Um, but we also looked at community partnerships. Are there other partnerships that we should be somehow leveraging in our community for opportunities with our students? Is there enough two-way communication going on with our families and how do we enhance and invite more of that? Um, broadcasting and celebrating different events, pride and cultural awareness of events, community-based projects and service learning, and overall district school and community events. So that's goal four and then Last but not least, goal five is stewardship of resources, and surprise, surprise, Jim would be our goal champion. And this is taking on like a sports kind of feel, right? Like introducing the champion. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if you need some walk-on music. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, goal five is stewardship of resources, and um, we want to develop and sustain effective, efficient, and equitable use of all our resources, not just finances. To optimize operations for improved student achievement, and maintain fiscal responsibility at the same time. Uh, the strategy is um, to use district resources equitably and the possible key performance indicators listed on the right here. Uh, a couple of these have been, you know, in our goals annually, like uh, to maintain the, the best rating with the state financial rating and um, always be aware of our per pupil costs and we've spent a lot of time since I've been here with the long range facilities plan and keeping it on schedule would be a key performance indication. Um, deferred maintenance and we want, uh, we want to end up with facilities that support student-centered learning and along the lines of the facilities, the furniture and equipment that support student-centered learning um, maintain uh, technology infrastructure and devices, but we also need to uh, be responsive to newer facility needs and technology needs. Thanks, Jim. So given that we are in June, and again, not wanting to put the cart before the horse, we've done a lot around bringing this plan to development through the work of the committee and then beginning to think about, you know, even living the plan. And so I just want to spend just a few minutes talking about how we might move this forward, but then again, kind of want to back up and make sure that each committee area sort of digs in, asks questions, adds comments. Um, and I, again, not wanting to, to move it forward too far before it's been approved, but also with a sense that we've been, been looking, about, looking at this along the way. and. Um, Again, wanting to, to do some future planning as we know that we need to be ready to, to really roll this out at the start of the new school year. So um, in each and every goal, we talk about these indicators, uh, measures, targets, and overall what we're really seeking is just clear alignment um, to the district overall. So another idea would be to create a scorecard um, or a data dashboard that really looks at key performance indicators. And again, not, we haven't agreed on those yet, but again, trying to make a lot of this much more visible, much more tangible um, to the entire community, using our website in that way, you know, sharing it out through communications, et cetera. So this is, again, just an example of, of how that might look in the student growth and achievement area. But again, this would be something that we would work toward, and as Angela pointed out, you know, identifying which, which parts of these goals are, you know, year one, year two, three, four, and five. We've talked about these suggested key performance indicators. Each team, as they kind of dig in, will look at those and again, we'll want board feedback on what, what feels most pertinent, relevant, needed, necessary in terms of making those determinations. We've talked already, you know, CEC's been a good partner in moving us through this process and also reminding us often why strategic plans fail. Um, and again, those, those, those top 10 reasons are listed here. You can take a look at those. But again, something that we've all taken time to kind of reflect on as we think about rolling out a new strategic plan. And again, just some other additional thoughts from the CEC has shared around, you know, making sure that a plan gets the buy-in, has the momentum, really becomes part of what people think and know and, and do as we, as we move toward, a, a, you know, and even 
better District 96. So, um, and again, I think this is another one. Common mistakes, again, this, this importance of buy-in and engagement, or just making things too complicated, having it not really be part of our district story, um, or just being un unrealistic. So again, it's been helpful for, um, for us to do some thinking and reflecting on that as a leadership team. And again, just a message that uh, comes to us and is shared with us by CEC, and we appreciate it. You, um, probably remember so we did actually a strategic management survey as board of education members you took that survey our district leadership team all took that survey and we actually asked our union representatives to take that survey also um, it's just a survey tool that cec uses around strategic management and looking at the overall maturity of our system or the overall maturity of our system is kind of right there in a more of a level three um, our goal would be to be in that really highly sustainable continuous improvement where this just becomes really part of our system and part of our process. So we certainly have work to do around that, but um, as uh, CEC has sort of shared with us too, we are where many, many, many school districts are. You know, I would say good leaders doing good things, great teachers doing great things with kids, but again, this idea of not making it person dependent, but really making it dependent on a set of shared goals and, and shared direction around focused values and, and a mission. So again, just this speaks to all the different groups um, that we'll need to continue to get feedback from, be part of the, the work in making this plan a truly livable plan. This is just a template that they've shared with us when we think about we identified those goal champions. We have not moved further on down about around creating action teams, et cetera. That is, again, getting um, too far down the road when the plan is not yet approved, but this is the kind of worksheet that we see ourselves working with as we move into next school year. And then I thought this was interesting and would be of interest to the Board of Education. Again, this is a draft from CEC. Um, this idea of how you really keep the strategic plan alive here at the board table also in terms of, you know, uh, an annual report but then you know maybe in October you report on progress toward goals three four and five and November one and two and kind of rotate um, updates on those goals and I see that as as good committee work as we move forward together also taking time to celebrate where there are accomplishments so again we can revisit that over time but I thought that was that was helpful I know that's something we've talked about around goal setting but also progress toward goals and hearing more regularly from district leaders and the action teams around our, our progress. So this is, and you actually all have a hard copy of this in front of you. So one of the things that CEC is kind of their, part of their formula for success, so to speak, in working with districts is that you're able to condense your whole plan onto one page. And um, given our goal of student ownership of learning, um, we also thought it'd be interesting to really to live that a little bit in our looking at our plan on a page and we reached out to actually Riverside Brookfield High School to their digital design um, course teacher and we were fortunate to have two students in the, um, the digital design class kind of take this on as a student project and one is what I think I would probably call the placemat um, that you have in front of you and again please consider it a draft but you know what our plan could look like if it was distilled down to one one page um, and then you also have a, a brochure sample that was created by another student in the digital design class and it's interesting just as we reflect on student ownership of learning these are high school students these aren't district 96 students they're a little bit older but um, you know we're, I heard back from the teacher quite regularly how much the students really embraced this as a project it was a, a real-life project for them they knew they had a client it was the neighboring school district and again just um, interesting feedback but I also think it's it's nice in terms of um, how it represents our plan overall so that is um, the draft district 96 strategic plan uh, I, again I want to thank Dan and Wesley for being part of the development and also ask if there's anything we left out as you sat through the 10 two-hour zoom sessions with the team and worked in your own breakout sessions and heard additional conversations if there's anything you'd want to add no, I mean, it was pretty comprehensive I think the only thing the only feedback I might give CEC is instead of doing uh, three eight-hour days maybe continue doing multiple two-hour days because I, I can only imagine how difficult that and how exhausted I would have been after eight hours of conversation 
I actually think this process ended up being better, in my opinion, because you talk for two hours, you're in your small groups, you go back to your large group, they helped kind of pull in the feedback in the moment, but then everybody could kind of walk away, think about it, you came back for round two, people had different opinions or additional opinions or you know whatever, and so I, I think it actually ended up with a, a better product than we would have been just trying to power through for eight straight hours. So. Um, no, it was, in my opinion, it was pretty comprehensive. I, I can't think of anything material that was missed in what you shared from me. Yeah, no, I, and I'm in agreement. I, I think the product is better than, we, the end product we got is, is better than if we would have been there three days straight. And boy, yeah, that would have been, <laughs> that would have been tough. And all that said, I, I would say that absent a pandemic, perhaps, a combination of somewhat of, of uh, minimal in-person, you know, interaction, getting to know people, shake hands, and yeah. get to know people, and then uh, I don't know. I think the virtual breakout rooms served really well, kept the conversation really focused, yeah. and, and, and I think that was uh, definitely a good thing to go into. Uh, I, I don't see anything missing. Uh, it, it as, as you mentioned, it was uh, very in-depth, a lot of participation. It's, it's I'm amazed that uh, when I'm going to uh, uh, t-ball games or uh, you, know, you know, soccer or anything like that, all the, all the faces I start to recognize and say, oh yeah, yeah, well, where are they? they must have been on the committee. I remember seeing them. So yeah, that, and I definitely was, was, uh, was glad to be a part of it. And I think it was a really wealth, worthwhile endeavor. That's, I would just say like that's the part I missed about being on Zoom, I agree. The two hour session seemed to work really well. It was missing those opportunities to connect. I mean, there were, you know, I feel that we actually both the staff that I know, but haven't had an opportunity to have those same in-depth conversations that we were having that strategic planning really elicited. And also for the parents that participated, they were great and they're interesting and they have interesting backgrounds and lives and commitment to our school district. And I just would have loved to have even more conversations with them, which probably happens during normal times when maybe you eat a lunch together then too or something. But um, I, think, I think it did work really well to have it in those more bite-sized chunks of two hours. The one thing that bothered me had you mentioned the, um, the stakeholder feedback. There was like 190 something responses on the first one. I think it was like 200 and something on the second one. The feedback we didn't get a lot of feedback, and it was it was mm -hmm. I believe the survey was like a scale of like how much you it was like a like completely disagree to completely agree type scale, and it was only flagged feedback was only flagged where there was a enough of a dispersion on one end or the other. And there was very little misalignment in what the group had already come up with. So there's only like four or five maybe areas where there were feedback. And the feedback was like seven people <coughs> said they strongly disagree with this out of like 290 people. So it, it, it was not, I was a little surprised there wasn't more feedback, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it seemed to be pretty aligned with, uh, with the additional group of people and at least how they were approaching what we were looking at, what they were thinking. Well, I guess another thing that I'll, I'll mention here, so it sounds like, uh, I forget which slide it is, but uh, where we're talking about, it sounds like there will be future presentations to the board to keep everyone engaged and in, in finding out how we're living the plan. I guess, you know, there are definitely a lot of, lot of bullet points where we could ask, you know, what do you mean by this or what, it, what is the plan for this? What is the, you know, how are we going to address this? But if we're addressing these things, you know, every other meeting or so, or, or every couple meetings, I think that would definitely be a great way to answer those questions over time of how, is, how are we living up to this plan and what are, what are the steps we're taking and what are our successes and, and where are the places we need to focus more attention on. Right. So we've talked, I you know, all along about sort of board goals should be the district administration goals should be the, you know, cl classroom goals and that there should be this kind of, you know, kind of nesting of, of shared goals and that the, the we're obviously having sort of the broadest lens on that and I, I know sometimes annually we've you know we've talked about like you know where do our goals come from they, they certainly come from the strategic plan and they were coming from the other strategic plan too I think that just this is just a new plan for a new day and um, I think a lot of the facilities work was very clearly stated in the last strategic plan I really think it helped guide the work of the whole master facilities process I'm excited you know I, I know that it doesn't mean that we would necessarily move forward with full day kindergarten, but the last strategic plan goal was to consider feasibility around having adequate, you know, facilities to be able to do it. So that way we've achieved that goal and now becomes a, 
probably a more challenging programmatic and financial decision around full day kindergarten. But um, again, I think the, the last plan served us well. I think it set a really clear foundation for this plan to now kind of evolve from there. Having participated in both, I, I would say that this is much more distilled. Uh, this is much more focused. It's much more refined. Uh, where you know, I kind of have a, remember a feeling uh, in the last you know, strategic plan, what five years ago, more than five years ago, uh, coming at the end of it, where these things were voted on, was like really that made it in? Uh, and I, I don't really feel that any of this was you know like not thought over, not discussed, not weighed, and, and uh, had input in from others. I think definitely the, the process was comes out with a much better product, much more refined product. We want to kind of look committee by committee and, you know, if there's other thoughts or comments or questions. I don't feel the need to, but uh, if others do, I mean, I'm, I mean, just speaking from the education committee, um, I'm really excited to have a clear focus and, and indicators that we are going to be able to measure and report out. I think um, the last few years, that's where I feel like we've lacked a little bit, is being able to report out um, in a focused manner directly related to a plan. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about this. I'm, I'm glad you and your team are going to have ownership of this. Um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's going to be great for the community to hear just these very detailed, uh, even if there's a dashboard on the website, places you can get information um, that aren't just kind of like, oh yeah, we're doing good, <laughs> you know, and digging into the areas where we need to grow. And so I'm, I'm excited. Um, I was not a part of the planning process, but I'm really pleased with it. And a lot of the things that I was hoping that would be on there are on there. So I'm um, personally, from that standpoint, I'm excited. So I don't feel like we need to go through it <laughs> each one. I think they did a good job of that, but. No, I, I agree, I agree with Linda. I mean, I, I like the plan. And Excited about it. I like especially that there's like metrics in there now that mm -hmm. we are able to sort of track to. Obviously, they're very ge general right now, but we, we it gives us the opportunity to. So I, I mean, if somebody if you want to, I'm fine. But I, I think I'm I like the leadership team. I believe what they did is great, and what you and Dan and Leslie did, like uh, that's a lot of work, and I appreciate it. I know there are a few things within finance that we wanted to maybe dig in just a little deeper because they also relate to some of our other just process steps around budget preview and also some information about testers. So we'll insert that. It relates to the strategic plan, but also pragmatically adding kind of a few key components. I included uh, the first draft of the budget for next year in the board packet and. We're on schedule to uh, have a more thorough review on June 16th and um, then have the hearing and vote to adopt this at the board meeting on July 21st. So it'll be just a couple weeks after the new fiscal year starts. So currently this year we're um, kind of expect to be favorable on both sides, on the revenue side um, the property tax money is already 2% over what we budgeted with a month to go. And um, on the expenditure side, I don't, I, I don't want to give a number, but I think that we're, um, there's definitely some areas we're going to come in favorable on that side too. And you know, we'll get the final number like November or so when the audit's on, but I'll have some preliminary numbers um, before that. As for the budget for next year, um, the budget I, summary that I gave you, a balanced budget, we added a net uh, 3.78 FTE, uh, 3.0 of that will be paid for out of the ESSER money. Um, let's see, each, each administrator has um, held their budget flat or most of them actually have cut at least a little bit out for next year, which helps when it comes to balancing. The uh, kind of guessing at salaries for the best, biggest part of the budget, but um, just use the same numbers I've used in the past for projecting. So when the contracts are settled, we'll be able to have um, 
more exact budget, I guess. Any questions on the budget I included tonight? Jim, how does this budget address um, our uh, teacher salaries? So Just what assumption is made with regards to increases? I used um, what I've been using for projections in the since I've been here actually is three percent on salaries. Okay, thank you. That yeah, was in there. that that distills it pretty well. So out of those uh, FTEs that you were mentioning, I, I'm, I'm assuming those three the, that are covered by ESSERS are relating to the, the uh, permanent subs that were hired? Well, we've got um, the five permanent subs, then there was the interventionist that would be part of ESSER, and a, um, English learner mm -hmm. that was a, we approved last month. There's an, ex, uh, an additional classroom at Blythe next year. And then we were able to reduce um, paraprofessional positions. So um, that that's where we are. We basically added eight and took away a little more than four. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of detailed uh, in the budget as you know in the categories that we have. Okay. And one of the. Um, at this point, anyway, the, one of the positions that I'm holding under ESSER, um, we probably won't fill this year, but if we get the opportunity to hire the right coach, um, we have the, we'll have the position in the budget. So that might be a, a I'm sorry, what was that, a what coach? Like an instructional coach. Instructional so that's probably okay. one that we are going to take time to study the impact of that, but Jim is uh, getting ahead on the, on the budgeting idea. Um, just in terms of a, sort of a, a placeholder for lack of a better term but it's something that um, instructional coaching kind of a big idea in education around that job embedded professional learning and um, it's it's really different than mentoring I, I shouldn't really make them the same but it, it relates to how we support staff through the process of just continuing to be a better and better teacher so it is it is represented in our plan but we also felt at this point in the year Probably as a school district, we wouldn't want to hire a coach. Um, oftentimes, you're hiring from within, and not sure we're ready to replace some of our best and brightest teachers to become a coach to have to then replace them at a time when we're not sure what we're seeing in terms of um, you know people in the in the pool. We're we're finding some quality candidates certainly, but um, people are noticing there's fewer candidates out there. So this idea of a teacher shortage or is the pandemic making teachers rethink their, you know, their career choice? I mean, all of that is something we're still evaluating. And uh, the SO3 uh, agenda item, I just put a reminder in front of you of the amount of money that's coming, you know, 1.3 million. And there was a new um, frequently asked question document that came out in May. So I attached that also, but we're, um, planning how we'll use that money and make sure we follow the steps that are required. So out of the three categorizations, are we able to say what we spent to date? In the first two? We yes. Roughly or ballpark? Or yeah, I mean, the first one was 150 and we, I don't know if it's all been spent, but it's basically committed mm -hmm. and, and uh, been approved. We haven't spend it all and we haven't gotten all the money but that one's almost done and as our two we know how we're going to spend that some of that was a, the air purifiers and um basically making the buildings ready um so that we could use them during COVID. but we've um we've earmarked money for that those are spent at the 1.3 that's almost new that we're going to make a plan on how that'll be spent. But the first two got us through to here. Okay. We've kind of talked about Esther's three. It's a, it's a large amount of money. It certainly starts to represent to us around student learning. You know, start out with masks and cleaning supplies and air purifiers and that kind of thing. And now it's, it's moving to the, to the student learning piece more. 
Thanks. Thanks, Jim. One, one comment, Martha and Jim. Thank you for the presentation on this. This is really easy to read and understand what the significant items are, I'm specifically calling out the use of the color coding and the, so that you can see what the number relates back to in terms of the, the little description. So thank you. That's all. <laughs> all right. I was waiting for the but. There's something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so no, no. But there, there is no but. But he doesn't like the colors. He likes to be different. No, I like the colors. These are awesome. I'm just kidding. I'm so, I want purple. So hard on me. Not blue. Okay. Yes, the next year is facilities goals. So, you know, as it relates to the facilities goals, but also we were going to do an update on the facilities advisory committee that had had met last week. Correct. Uh, facilities met last was Thursday. I, days are blending in again. Um, I'll highlight, you have the agenda in front of you. The significant items are the, the required documentation has been received by Ramesh for the contracts at Hollywood and Central. And so both of those contractors are verified to be ready to go. And as you know, the central project is on a very tight timeline. Um, a lot of work that needs to happen in a short amount of time, but that contractor has been vetted and is prepared to do the work that we need. Uh, the second thing is with Blythe Park, we are going to be looking at uh, having DLA look at options in terms of making Blythe uh, two-section compatible. Uh, we will have them spend a little bit of extra time looking at their concepts and ideas regarding using the auditorium. And the auditorium has its own complications with regards to access and expense to modify that, so they will also be looking at potential room additions but that also has its own complication with regards to the building because it is a considered a historic building. It's a unique, it's kind of a, a unique building that was ushered in a new, new ideas about how schools could look. So there are outside forces, namely Riverside Preservation, that does have a, a say in how that, uh, any changes that happen there. We will be looking again, revisiting, coming back to the Central Hauser campus. And honestly, the, the strategic plan really fits in well with this because one of the things that we discussed a couple months ago was the need for a playground, which gets us into the equity situation and having a playground for the elementary kids at each school, and then also to how exactly are we going to make that the grassy area usable throughout the year? In preparation for that, we will be, DLA and their civil engineer will be doing a really good survey of the utilities and the stormwater underneath the parking lot to understand what the complications are and what we need to do to meet permit requirements. As you know, stormwater is uh, has a lot of regulation tied to it and also zoning requirements. That's in reference to Central? That's in reference to Central, yes sir. And um, Jim has a summer maintenance plan that he's also is color-coded in his budget document so you can see the various items that are there. And uh, with regards to DLA, sorry I jumped around a little bit, we will, for Blythe, we will have them, they have a preliminary MOU, but we've asked them to go back and give us that in kind of a phasing. Uh, let's look at the concepts at Blythe first before you move forward. And then one item that we would like to bring back to the board is that we would like to extend Ramesh's contract. Uh, to further engage in his services. He's doing a great job for us. He is very attentive to 
um, keeping the contractors both on track with in time and in budget and we'd like to continue his services Martha did I I don't think I forgot anything but it's always possible I don't think so that sounded great questions for Joel or for Jim and I related to that when is the contract with the Sarah up uh, it's actually, he's working under basically a handshake, a handshake. Okay. Yes. So th I had a, I had a feeling that we were, uh -huh. yeah. he, he was very, uh, low key in his identifying that that was, had expired, mm -hmm. but he is right now it's handshake and we should formalize that. Yeah. He's, he's been fantastic. So. <laughs> <Sold>. Guest <done. laughs> And one other committee check in on per personnel. Personnel. What's the one stuff? Oh, uh. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd want to say about the strategic plan um, related to the personnel items? Related to the personnel. Uh, no, I think it'll be good to start looking at some of this stuff a little bit closer in a more targeted fashion. Um, I think there's a lot more to it than just kind of the, the facade that's here. So figuring out what those goals actually look like and mm -hmm. how we're going to measure those things. And, and as Angela and Martha both said a couple different times, this is a five-year plan. So what is goal number, goal in year number one, year number two, year number three? How are we measuring the progress over time? I don't know that we, there was some stuff in there with the, the last plan, but it wasn't really vetted out. It wasn't really like a key part of what we engaged in so just having a little bit more of a spotlight on what that means and putting a little bit more focus or targeted focus maybe whatever you want to call it around staff and needs and just i guess maybe the, the only comment i'll say is like these things are not done in silos everything impacts the other thing so having like that calendar that was showed up or something around there of targeting dates to say you know here's when testing happens give angelo a month to review it report out to the board progress three months later whatever the next thing is and then we fill in the gaps there with jim has a regulatory type process with right. budget but kind of having that for each of these these plans will really help us stay on on target and not let things kind of slip under the rug or or kind of lose sight of it and stuff like that so i don't know that's more to come on personnel i feel like i i usually say nothing to report but a lot of the personnel stuff is not really like public commentary type things um so a lot of this might might be behind the scenes stuff but like coaching and report outs of, of different stuff could would be more more of something we could talk about in a public setting not individual components of, of different things that are kind of um, not really for public consumption so to speak so right. that's what I'm good. Thank, thank you all for taking a look at this. I know we will formally vote on an approval at the June 16th meeting. I know um, Don has also said, should I modify the website? We have a parent handbook that has our old mission statement. Like it, it's very interesting to think about the things that are occurring right now. Um, if there was sort of enough board endorsement, it's what I, I hear, right? That, you know, would you be comfortable if we start updating some of our documents along the way? Um, I, I don't think there's going to be significant editing, and I'm going to guess that it's going to get approved. So, um, but I, again, I, I want to be thoughtful about that, and I don't want to certainly make the board feel pushed into a corner around that, but it, it has been certainly a process, and I, I appreciate I, the feedback along the way. I feel like there's enough board endorsement to move forward with those yeah. items. Let's get them done <laughs> as yeah. we can. Yeah. This is truly the shell. All the, the real stuff comes later of what we're actually going to try to achieve, so. I would be, I would be comfortable with that. Yeah, I'll speak I would. Others. Yeah, you feeling okay on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, there's pieces to the shell, right? That that matter around some pieces that we put together. Um, we are ordering T-shirts for the staff that say "Empowering Learners for Life." So one of the things um, that truly is talked about is having strong visual representation of your plan in a way that people really understand it and know about the, the change and the shift. So um, more visuals to come. And um, I realize this one needs the goals on the back, I think. The goals and strategies on the back of our placemat. So something more to think about. 
Anyway, thank you all very much. Um, special thanks to Dan and, and to Wesley for being part of it, for all of you for giving us feedback along the way. And um, I'm, I'm excited about it too. I feel like it really represents kind of a transformational moment for the district in terms of um, a lot of really strong foundational work and just some areas where people are really coming together and really coalescing on areas that they want to see grow for growth and improvement for the district. So thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you all for giving us such a great uh, overview and uh, presentation. Definitely uh, seems there's been, there was a lot of work and, and thought on everyone's part going into putting the plan. So it's good to see that uh, you're all off uh, uh, making a lot of progress on, on uh, filling in the blanks on what that plan will be. All right. Uh, let's see. Kathy, is there any public comment? No, there's not. Okay. Future meeting dates will be June 16th, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. in the multi-purpose room of Ames. Board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. if necessary and return to open session at 7. Uh, July 7th, committee of the whole meeting, 7 p.m. in the Ames multi-purpose room. July 21st, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. in the multi-purpose room at Ames. The board will enter into closed session at 6.30 p.m. if necessary and return to open session at 7. Uh, August 4th will be a board self-assessment committee of the whole meeting in the Ames multi-purpose room. Uh, and if there is nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.